hush silence. Thank you. So welcome and good evening. And um, we're here tonight to celebrate Daryl Jones' elevation to his own personal chair. I'm very excited uh, <laughs> to be here um, to celebrate this. And particularly, I'm interested in the topic. I think, like many of us, you know, we'll all have read Sherlock Holmes, which is uh, a very, very wise choice. We're gathered here officially to celebrate this new chair in the School of English, the chair of modern British literature and culture, a name Daryl chose himself. Uh, this is our fifth inaugural of the year, and uh, it's really a great joy to be here in person um, to celebrate. The year has been bookended by two School of English inaugurals, Andy Murphy and Daryl Jones. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Gail McElroy. I'm Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences here. And I'm particularly pleased to be able to celebrate Daryl this evening. He's a good friend, and he is also uh, a great you know, confidant. Uh, and I would, I suppose I would say he's my rant buddy. I can feel safe <laughs> ranting to him. <laughs> uh, a, a particular warm welcome to the Provost of Trinity College Dublin, Dr. Linda Doyle, the Vice Provost, Professor Orla Shields, and also we have a number of annual officers here. I'm a bit short-sighted, but I can see the senior lecturer, David Shepherd, and perhaps the registrar is here as well, uh, Neville Cox. And we're also very pleased um, to have the head of the School of English, uh, Jarlath Killeen, here this evening. I asked Daryl, was there anybody in particular he wanted to welcome? And he said, everyone. So. <laughs> So I'm going to go a bit rogue, and I'm going to actually specially welcome your wife, Margaret Robinson. <laughs> and Daryl's daughter, who, Morgan, who's flown over to join us this evening. <laughs> so for those of you for whom it is your first inaugural, inaugurals are significant events um, in an academic staff life. Um, for newly appointed professors, it's an opportunity to showcase their research to the college community and to members of the public. And as such, you will see that, you know, we like a bit of fancy dress here in Trinity, so uh, we get to wear our gowns. Um, Daryl is sporting the very fetching grey and red of York, and a slightly duller uh, pedestrian BA degree to, do, to gown. Yeah. <laughs> So one of the great joys of these occasions for me is I get to kind of plow into the history of the university. So a little background on English in Trinity. The first professorship of English uh, was established as recently as 1855. That's recent for us as we were around since 1592. Long after professorships of music, French, physic, midwifery, Irish, chemistry, botany, Greek. And it was a slightly accidental um, uh, foundation. Um, it was created due to the ambitions of one John Kells Ingram. He was appointed professor of oratory, but he found that was a bit uh, confining. So he lobbied board to have it expanded to become the chair of oratory and English literature. Um, he, was a great, he, he was a great scholar, and his lectures were very, very popular, and he was very, very ambitious. So he created um, the subject of English as a subject for the new moderatorship course. However, Board wasn't too, you know, too keen on it just being in English. They felt it needed to be, you know, it was a bit soft, so they needed it to be bolstered. So it was originally English literature, modern history, jurisprudence, and economics. <laughs> Disciplinary snobbery goes back a long way, not looking at any of the lawyers, historians, or economists in the room. Um, the first curriculum was pretty, pretty um, conservative. It wasn't adventurous at all and was limited to Shakespeare, Bacon, Johnson, and Goldsmith. Chaucer and Spencer were added a number of years later, but it was only in 1869 that they were as adventurous as to add the Romantics. I'm not entirely sure what they would have made of popular crime fiction, but um, I guess it predates them and their loss. Um, in 1870, John Ingram proposed the breaking up. He was a very ambitious man. He proposed the breaking up of the degree in English history, law, and economics. One suspects he might not be, like many of uh, scholars of English today, the greatest fan of TEP. And, uh, and it was created as a moderatorship, half of a moderatorship, in which the other half could be French or German. 
Much of the early success of English um, was due to Ingram's successor, a very, very famous man, Edward Dowden. Um, he's one of the most important literary critics of the 19th century and a person crucial to the development of English literature as an academic discipline globally. And um, English has never looked back since in Trinity. The various holders of chairs, including tonight's speaker, um, have played an important role in making the School of English what it is today, one of the world's most outstanding departments of English literature and Trinity's most highly ranked school, currently 25th in the world. So congratulations to all of you. So now to the important star of the evening, Professor Daryl Jones. Daryl was born and brought up in the Rhondda Valley in South Wales. He was educated entirely through the medium of Welsh until he was 18, at which stage he took off to York, where he got a BA in English in 1989 and his DPhil in 1995 on the topic of Jane Austen. He came to Trinity in September 1994, day after handing in his DPhil, and he's never looked back since. <laughs> he's even got Irish citizenship now. <laughs> So Daryl was head of the School of English from 2009 to 2012 and Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences from 2014 to 19. Daryl's main area of research is late Victorian and Edwardian popular fiction with a particular interest in ghost stories and Gothic and horror fiction in general. He's had a transformational impact on the study of English, mainstreaming these genres as, as um, subject matter of serious study. So, um, very, very important member of the school and of the discipline of English globally. Daryl is a most prolific scholar. He's written and, or edited 13 books, including five monographs, most recently Horror, A Very Short Introduction, which came out with OUP in 2021. And his current research projects include a large-scale biography of the ghostwriter M. Orr James. Um, he's general editor of the forthcoming new Oxford Sherlock Holmes, all nine volumes in press and he also edited The Hound of the Baskervilles in that series. He's currently editing The Green Flag for this multi-volume Edinburgh um, Press Conan Doyle um, series. And he's just contracted a monograph on the Cambridge ghost story. He's clearly showing no signs of slowing down or resting on his laurels. So tonight he will deliver a talk entitled On the Trail of the Hound of the Baskervilles, inspired by his work editing said book. And with that, I will hand, hand over to Professor Jones. Oh, blimey. Um, thank you, Gail. I, I don't recognize that person you've just introduced at all, but he sounds fantastic. So, um, Provost, Vice Provost, Dean, uh, colleagues, friends, thank you all for coming. Uh, before I start, particular thanks to uh, Valerie Smith and Jay Brettel from the faculty office for bringing us all together uh, tonight. Um, thanks to my colleagues in the School of English um, for making it the, the best imaginable place to work and think. Um, and since he's here, particular thanks uh, to, to Nicky Green, uh, the man who 28 years ago uh, was, was rash enough to give me a job. <laughs> Look what you've done. <laughs> yeah. Um, and most especially, um, though we've already had uh, those thanks, um, uh, uh, thanks to my wife, Margaret, who is here, um, and who for over 30 years has been by far the best thing about me. <laughs> so... The lecture. Let's inaugurate. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes was dead to begin with. Killed Holmes, Conan Doyle wrote in his diary in December 1893 on the publication of The Final Problem. When the great detective plunged to his death over the Reichenbach Falls, wrestling with his nemesis, Professor Moriarty, this was the cause of 
national shock and bereavement. You brute, one appalled correspondent, wrote to Conan Doyle in the city of London. It was claimed Clarks donned black armbands in mourning. Just two years earlier, in 1891, Dr. Arthur Conan Doyle, author and ophthalmologist, had sent a pair of Sherlock Holmes stories, A Scandal in Bohemia and The Red-Headed League, to Herbert Greenoff Smith, the editor of The Strand magazine. And this event was to change the lives of Conan Doyle, Greenoff Smith, and the mag magazine's publisher, George Nunes. Writing long after the fact, Smith recalled that I had once realized that he was the greatest short story writer since Edgar Allan Poe. I remember rushing into Mr. Noon's room and thrusting the stories before his eyes. While there may be some hindsight involved here, the judgment wasn't wrong. When a scandal in Bohemia was published in the Strand in June 1891, it marked the beginning of a phenomenal relationship, the making of both the author and the magazine. Together, these three men, Conan Doyle, George Nunes, and Herbert Greenough Smith, started a revolution which changed the face of popular fiction in Britain and across the English-speaking world. The first appearance of Holmes marked the beginning of a major boom in periodical publication and one of the great periods of popular genre fiction in English. And such was their success that Conan Doyle wrote to Smith claiming that, and I quote, foreigners used to recognize the English by their check suits. I think they will soon learn to do it by their strand magazines. Everybody on the channel boat, except the man at the wheel, was clutching one. But while Holmes was the making of Conan Doyle, he was also, the author began to feel his undoing. Right up to the end of his life, Doyle felt that his real talents lay as a historical novelist. He maintained that his historical novels, The White Company and Sir Nigel, were the most complete, satisfying thing I've ever done. All things find their level, but I believe that if I had never touched Holmes, who has tended to obscure my higher work, my position in literature would at the present moment be a more commanding one. Sherlock Holmes, he said, had become a sort of nightmare, an old man of the sea about my neck. He reportedly said this to the Reverend Silas K. Hocking, in whose company he first visited the Reichenbach Falls in the Swiss Alps in August 1893. If I don't kill him soon, he'll kill me. And so, off the falls, Holmes and Moriarty plunged, reeling over, locked in each other's arms, deep down into the dreadful cauldron of swirling water and seething foam, there to lie for all time. He wasn't coming back. Poor Holmes is dead and damned, Doyle wrote to the novelist David Christie Murray. I couldn't revive him, if I wanted to, at least not for years, for I've had such an overdose of him that I feel towards him as I do towards pâté de foie gras, of which I once ate too much. <laughs> the very idea of Sherlock Holmes made Arthur Conan Doyle feel sick. At least not for years. Doyle's parenthetical remark left the door open, just a tiny crack, for the return of Sherlock Holmes somewhere down the line. And down there in the deep, the corpse did twitch a couple of times in the years to come. In July and August 1898, the Strand published a pair of semi Holmes stories, The Man with the Watches and The Lost Special, in which an unnamed detective or amateur reasoner of some celebrity proposes solutions to fiendishly difficult crimes. It is one of the elementary principles of practical reasoning, the amateur reasoner claims, standing for all the world, like Holmes, that when the impossible has been eliminated, the residuum, however improbable, must contain the truth. The Man with the Watches and The Lost Special simultaneously were and were not Holmes stories. 
but they at least allowed for the possibility of the great detective's return. And such a return would have proved enormously lucrative for all concerned. And by the spring of 1901, the time was definitely right. In November 1899, the American actor William Gillette's play Sherlock Holmes began a spectacularly successful theatrical run in the Garrick Theatre in New York. It was due to start its West End run in London in September 1901. And so, Conan Doyle wrote to Greenhoff Smith proposing either a non-Holmes story for his regular fee of 50 pounds per 1,000 1, words, or else a new Holmes novel for double that amount. And there was no doubt as to what the decision would be. The precise figures are a little cloudy, but it's been suggested that The Hound of the Baskervilles in serial form added between 30,000 and 150,000 to the Strand's sales. For the first and only time in its history, issues of the magazine went through a seventh printing to accommodate the unprecedented demand. The Strand had always paid its authors well. Doyle got, fifth, got 30 guineas each for the first set of home stories, not bad for an effective unknown, and 50 guineas each for the second set. For Baskervilles, he earned between 480 and 620 pounds per instalment, some 6,000 in total, about the same as it had just cost him to build his opulent new house. Undershaw, a 14-bedroom mansion on four acre lots near Hindhead in Surrey. For a professional writer like Arthur Conan Doyle, the pull of Holmes was always ultimately irresistible. You'll be amused to hear that I am, I am at work upon a Sherlock Holmes story, he wrote to Greenough Smith. So the old dog returns to his vomit. <laughs> he still felt sick, but think of the money. The story of the Hound of the Baskervilles begins with three men returning to England from South Africa. The first of these is Arthur Conan Doyle himself. Always a committed imperialist and militarist, when the Second Boer War broke out in 1899, Doyle went to the headquarters of the Middlesex Yeomanry in Hounslow to enlist in the army. What I feel, he wrote to his mother, is that I have perhaps the strongest influence over young men especially young athletic sporting men, of anyone in England bar Kipling. That being so, it is really important that I give them a lead. He was a man of 40, with no military training or experience. And so, he recalled, the colonel would only put me on his waiting list, took my name, still without recognizing me, and passed on to the next case. I departed somewhat crestfallen and unsettled. But shortly afterwards, he took the opportunity to go to South Africa as a military doctor based on, in a field hospital set up on a cricket pitch in Bloemfontein, where he treated an outbreak of enteric fever, typhoid, amongst the troops, which he believed was caused by the Boers cutting off the water supply to the town, and which cost 5,000 lives. On the voyage back from South Africa, Conan Doyle became friendly with another man returning from the conflict, the journalist Bertram Fletcher Robinson. Uh, that's Robinson in the middle with a with flat cap sitting down, and behind him with a broad-brimmed hat is Conan Doyle. This is on the journey back from South Africa. Robinson was very much the kind of masculine type that Arthur Conan Doyle liked and admired. A six-foot-three Cambridge rugby blue and college rower. Bertram Fletcher Robinson was an immense figure of a man, his friend the novelist Max Pemberton recalled, a magnificent rugby forward and a fine rider to hounds. Fletcher Robinson came from a family with a strong background in colonial adventures. His father was a friend of Giuseppe Garibaldi, alongside whom he fought in Argentina against the dictator Juan Manuel de Rosas in the 1840s before going on to help map the west coast of South America in the 1850s, and then undertaking a 700-mile trek across the Andes on horseback.
horseback. After Cambridge, Robinson began to make a name for himself as a military journalist, writing the series Famous Regiments for Cassell's magazine. And this attracted the attention of Arthur Pearson, publisher of the rival Pearson's magazine, who offered Fletcher Robinson a job as a war correspondent for his new publishing endeavor, a morning newspaper called, and still called, the Daily Express. On his return from South Africa, Robinson was appointed editor of the Express, aged just 34. After they got back from South Africa, Conan Doyle and Fletcher Robinson kept in touch and arranged to go on a golfing holiday together to the Royal Lynx Hotel in Cromer on the Norfolk coast. It was from the Royal Lynx that Conan Doyle wrote to his mother in March 1901, Fletcher Robinson came here with me and we are going to do a small book together. The Hound of the Baskervilles, a real creeper. The following month, Conan Doyle paid a visit to Fletcher Robinson's family home at Ippleken, Devon, on the fringes of the unearthly wilderness of Dartmoor. Our third returning South African is the man who precipitates the action of the Hound of the Baskervilles, Sir Charles Sir Charles has made a fortune in the South African gold fields, realised his gains, we are told, and returned to England with them, and moved into the ancestral home of Baskerville Hall, which he plans to modernise and renovate. The total value of the estate that Watson tells us was close to a million. Sir Charles has made his money in speculation, investment in gold mines, rather than ownership of them. And Conan Doyle himself had investments in both Australian and South African gold mines from 1892 and bought shares in the Robinson Deep Central Mine in Johannesburg in 1902. He had a personal interest in South African gold. South Africa, with its unparalleled mineral resources, its fabulous gold fields and legendary diamond mines, was strategically and economically vital to the British Empire, and had been one of the imaginative centers of British imperial fiction since the spectacular success of H. Ryder Haggard's King Solomon's Mines in 1885. More generally, at least since Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone in 1868, British imperial fiction had been fascinated by the far-flung empire as the source of endless loot. As the Indian intellectual Shashi Tharoor has written, India was governed for the benefit of Britain. Britain's rise for 200 years was financed by its depredations in India. The moonstone itself, plundered from a Hindu temple, is closely modeled on the most legendary of all imperial gemstones, the fabulous cursed Kohinoor, the mountain of light, a stone around which legends have swirled for centuries. Uh, here it is in one of the crowns of the crown jewels. The moonstone was an important influence on the young Conan Doyle, providing some of the inspiration for his early novel, The Mystery of Clumba, 1888, in which a trio of Indian mystics pursue a British soldier to his remote home in Scotland to enact retribution for an atrocity he committed as a younger man. The Moonstone also lies somewhere behind The Sign of the Four, the second Holmes novel about the search for a priceless collection of jewels, including the great mogul said to be the second largest stone in existence, stolen from Agra Fort during the First War of Indian Independence in 1857. In the same novel, Dr. Watson reveals that he has himself spent time in the Australian gold fields, where he visited, he says, a hill near Ballarat where the prospectors had been at work. Baskervilles is in fact full of returning colonials. Sir Henry Baskerville, Sir Charles' heir, has been farming in Canada and still speaks with a North American drawl. 
Stapleton is the son of the wicked Roger Baskerville, who fled to Central America and died there in 1876 of yellow fever, but not before fathering a son with his Latin American wife. This son is Roger Baskerville Jr., who comes to England to get his hands on the Baskerville fortune and changes his name to Vandeleur and then to Stapleton. And he brings with him his own exotic jewel, his wife, Beryl Garcia, one of the beauties of Costa Rica. Dr. Watson himself had returned to London only a few years earlier, having been invalided out of the British Army after being wounded during the Afghan wars. So, during their stay in the Royal Lynx Hotel in Cromer, Conan Doyle and Fletcher Robinson cooked up the idea for a novel called The Hound of the Baskervilles. But this is not the novel that you have read, or not exactly. The precise nature and extent of Fletcher Robinson's contribution to Baskervilles has been much disputed and at times a controversial subject down the years. What seems to have happened is that the pair began talking about Norfolk folklore, and most particularly about the local legend of Black Shuck, a local demon hound. Shuck is from the Anglo-Saxon skuka, meaning devil or Satan, which in turn led to a discussion of the many analogous black dog legends from around Robinson's native Dartmoor. And so the pair began to draw up the plot for a supernatural tale, a gothic novel set on Dartmoor about the legend of a demonic hound. This is what animates the letter that Conan Doyle sent to Greenough Smith on the subject of his new novel. I have the idea of a real creeper, he liked that phrase, for the strand. It is full of surprises, breaking naturally into good lengths for serial purposes. There is one stipulation. I must do it with my friend Fletcher Robinson, and his name must appear with mine. I can answer for the yarn being all my own, in my own style, without dilution, since your readers like that. But he gave me the central idea, and the local colour, and so I feel his name must appear. What doesn't appear in this early description of Baskervilles is any account of Sherlock Holmes. But the idea to write a new Holmes story too good to resist, came to Doyle as he was working on the early drafting of Baskervilles. It was certainly clear in his mind by the time he visited Ippelpen the following month. And so, what we have here in The Hound of the Baskervilles is a Sherlock Holmes story overlaid onto the original structure of a Gothic novel. And this explains a number of the novel's features. It accounts for its highly creative sense of tension between the material and the supernatural worlds, a tension which gives the novel a good deal of its power and appeal, as the readers, like the characters themselves, are faced with a generic and categorical mystery. What kind of novel are we reading? It also accounts for Sherlock Holmes' own absence from large parts of the novel, from the end of chapter 5 to the beginning of chapter 12, as Watson's narrative describes the uncanny landscape of Dartmoor, a space of epistemological uncertainty, and possibly of magic. The published novel, then, is not the proposed novel. And by the time Baskervilles began its serialization, Conan Doyle had changed his position on shared authorship. The first installment in the Strand magazine of August 1901 was entitled, here it is, The Hound of the Baskervilles, Another Adventure of Sherlock Holmes by A. Conan Doyle. By Conan Doyle. Uh, the asterisk led readers to a footnote. This story owes its inception to my friend, Mr. Fletcher Robinson, who has helped me both in the general plot and in the local details, ACD. By the time of the first book edition, the following year, in 1902, the dedication had changed again. My dear Robinson, 
It was to your account of a West Country legend that this tale owes its inception. For this, and for your help in the detail, all thanks yours most truly, A. Conan Doyle. For the American edition, a few weeks later, the phrase, this tale owes its inception, had been considerably weakened to first suggested the idea of this little tale to my mind. For the John Murray collected edition of 1929, Conan Doyle felt obliged to gloss further. I should add, he writes, that the plot and every word of the actual narrative was my own. <laughs> In his account of the authorship of Baskervilles, Greenough Smith downplayed Fletcher Robinson's role yet further. As readers of the story are aware, Fletcher Robinson's name was fully acknowledged. His share in the transaction was to draw the attention of Conan Doyle to the tradition of a fiery hound in a Welsh guidebook. Some of Robinson's friends certainly believed he'd been cheated. The prolific novelist Archibald Marshall, Cambridge chum, was adamant that Robinson wrote most of the first instalment for the, of the Strand magazine I'm assuming he means the curse of the Baskervilles. Marshall believed that Doyle had agreed to pay Robinson 25% of the earnings from Baskervilles. Andrew Lysett, Conan Doyle's most authoritative biographer, believes that the, uh, the agreement was even more generous, with Fletcher Robinson promised a third of the earnings. In the event, he got much less, 2,000 pounds. He got much less. Conan Doyle wrote him a check for 500 pounds, in the latter part of 1901, but subsequent payments were more sporadic. In the event, Bertram Fletcher Robinson did get to write his own, much less successful story of a phantom hound. The Terror in the Snow is one of the Chronicles of Addington Peace, a volume of detective stories he published in 1905. Set in Cloudham, Norfolk, that's Cromer, the story begins like Baskervilles with an ancestral legend. In the 18th century, the nobleman Philip de Lorne brings home an albino wolf from St. Petersburg as a pet. The wolf kills de Lorne's young son, tearing his throat out, and so de Lorne kills the beast with his own hands. Cursed, the de Lorne family falls into ruin, and Cloudham is haunted by the spirit of the wolf. The beast walks. There's not a laborer in Norfolk who would go into the lower garden on any night of the year, much less Christmas Eve. Bertram Fletcher Robinson died in 1907, aged just 36, of typhoid, caused by drinking contaminated water in a Parisian hotel. Occult rumors hung around his death for decades afterwards, beginning with the persistent story that he was killed by an Egyptian mummy's curse. In 1904, <coughs> he had published a front page story in the Express entitled, A Priestess of Death, The Weird Story of an Egyptian Coffin. And Conan Doyle began, came to believe this story of the mummy's curse. Six uh, years later, rather, after the death of Lord Carnarvon at the excavation of the tomb of Tutankhamun in 1923, the Daily Express reported Conan Doyle as saying, the death of Mr. Fletcher Robinson was caused by Egyptian elementals guarding a female mummy because Mr. Robinson had begun an investigation of the stories of the mummy's malevolence. I warned Mr. Robinson against concerning himself with the mummy at the British Museum. He persisted, and his death occurred. Arthur Conan Doyle was a lifelong believer in the supernatural, but Sherlock Holmes was not. In The Sussex Vampire, the Holmes story, Holmes famously dismisses the possibility of the supernatural. Rubbish, Watson, rubbish. This agency stands flat-footed upon the ground, and there it must remain. The world is big enough for us. No ghosts need apply. But in the uncertain terrain of the great Grimpen Mire, as we shall see, 
It was impossible to stand flat-footed upon the ground without sinking in and being swallowed up. And so the Hound of the Baskervilles maintains a delicately balanced undecidability throughout in a manner that seems to affect even Holmes's fundamentalist materialism. Is it a rational detective story set in the positivistic, scientific, industrial world of Victorian England? Or is it a supernatural Gothic tale set in a haunted, ambiguous landscape in which past and present collide? As the history of its composition and the practice of reading it demonstrates, the novel is simultaneously both things. The Hound of the Baskervilles stands on the threshold between two worlds, with a foot in each, a phantom hound which leaves material footprints. On hearing the legend of the Baskerville demon, Holmes remarks, in a modest way, I have combated evil, but to take on the father of evil himself would perhaps be too ambitious a task. The parenthetical, perhaps here, signals the novel's categorical slipperiness. Holmes is probably not up to taking on Satan himself, in whom it would seem he probably does not believe. But when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Holmes advises Sir Henry to avoid the moor in the hours of darkness when the powers of evil are exalted. Sir Henry in turn vows, we'll see it through if all the fiends of the pit were loose upon the moor. In The Hound of the Baskervilles, Sherlock Holmes himself is an ambiguous presence, simultaneously alive and dead. Conan Doyle did not precisely bring Holmes back from the dead for Baskervilles. Rather, the novel presents itself as a posthumous tale, a recounting of an earlier adventure, which takes place before the fateful encounter on the Reichenbach Falls. But in the autumn of 1903, some 18 months after the publication of the book version of Baskervilles, Doyle published a new Holmes story, The Empty Room, in which Holmes is unambiguously brought back to life, but in a manner which has decidedly mystical overtones. <laughs> Having miraculously survived the Reichenbach Falls, Holmes tells Watson that for the past three years, he, Holmes, has walked the earth on a spiritual or even a spiritualist odyssey, traveling for two of those years in Tibet, where he spends time with the Dalai Lama in Lhasa, and going on a pilgrimage to Mecca. In traveling to Dartmoor in Baskervilles, Holmes goes on another spiritual journey of sorts. Early in the novel, he and Watson have the following discussion. Where do you think I've been, asks Holmes. I have been to Devonshire. In spirit? Watson asks. Exactly. My body remained in this armchair and has, I regret to observe, consumed in my absence two large pots of coffee and an incredible amount of tobacco. After you left, I sent down to Stanford's for the ordnance map of this portion of the moor, and my spirit has hovered about it all day. Holmes is evoking the language of astral projection here, a subject in which Doyle had been interested since the very beginning of his writing career. He appended an essay on the occult philosophy to his early novel, The Mystery of Klumba, in which he discusses, and I quote, 
the Eastern adepts who exist at present principally in the north of India and in Tibet. An adept can put off his soul as he would put off his greatcoat and can travel in, the so in his soul with the rapidity of thought to the other end of the world. This endows him with practical omniscience as far as mundane matters are concerned. There was, in fact, always something bordering on the supernatural about Holmes's practical omniscience. As far back as the first Holmes story, A Study in Scarlet, in 1887, his first, in his first ever account of Holmes's methods, Watson observes that the uninitiated might well consider him as a necromancer. Although materially absent from the whole central portion of the novel, Holmes's spirit does indeed hover over Dartmoor, as for Watson, he takes on the guise of the mysterious, supernatural genius loci, the man on the tour, the unseen watcher, the man of darkness. He stood with his legs a little separated, his arms folded, his head bowed, as if he were brooding over that enormous wilderness of peat and granite that lay behind him. He might have been the very spirit of that terrible place. Conan Doyle's Dartmoor is a phantasmagoric place. Even the stolid Foursquare Watson understands this. <coughs> His first impression of the moor is that it is like some fantastic landscape in a dream. <coughs> Excuse me. Like an English lost world, the moor contains its own unique ecosystem. Fabulous moths, rare orchids, enormous phosphorescent hounds. It is Stapleton, the Anglo-Costa Rican naturalist and murderer, who feels most at home on the moor. It is his family home, and who best understands its meaning, he says to Watson. It is a wonderful place, the moor. You never tire of the moor. You cannot think of the wonderful secrets which it contains. It is so vast and so barren and so mysterious, all things are possible. During their long days hiking on the moor, Conan Doyle and Fletcher Robinson visited Fox Tor Mire, a peat bog over a granite floor a few miles from their base in Princetown. I took Doyle to see the mighty bog, a thousand acres of quaking slime, Robinson wrote. The novel's gothic imagination transformed this already remarkable spot into one of the most extraordinary pieces of symbolic landscape in English literature, the Great Grimpen Mire. And here it is. The Great Grimpen Mire is the very emblem of the novel's categorical ambiguity and uncertainty, the place where you cannot find your feet, into which characters may sink hopelessly lost, a false step yonder means death to man or beast, Stapleton warns, and out of which mysterious things may emerge. From the moment he arrives in Dartmoor, Watson recognizes, I have been conscious of shadows all round me. Life has become like the great Grimpen Mire with little green patches everywhere into which one may sink with no guide and point to point the track. The mystery of the Hound of the Baskervilles, he writes, is this bog in which we are floundering. And the Maya may indeed be alive, a conscious actor in the plot. It seems to let out a long, low moan, indescribably sad. It's the weirdest, strangest thing that I ever heard in my life, Watson says. At the end of the novel, when he and Holmes venture into the dark, quivering mire, he feels as if some malignant hand were tugging us down into these obscene depths. So grim and purposeful was the clutch in which it held us. Conan Doyle's fiction frequently, very frequently, returns to the symbolic 
possibilities of bogs, quicksands, and other varieties of uncertain shifting terrain. For one thing, as several critics have suggested, in their very instability, bogs and their analogues can be made to signify, in Catherine Wynne's phrase, the control or ownership of land. Discussing another late Victorian bog novel, Bram Stoker's The Snake's Pass, Nicholas Daly writes, not only does the bog physically resist the surveyor's project, it also produces from its depths disturbing reminders of the history of the colonial project. The Maya, then, is a disputed landscape over which a number of returning colonials, a South African, a Canadian, a Costa Rican, make plausible claims. As the son of Roger Baskerville, in a direct line from the ancestral Hugo, Stapleton may well have the clearest moral and perhaps legal claim to ownership. Certainly he is the one, as we've seen, who identifies most strongly by far with the landscape, even to the extent of being absorbed into it at the end of the novel. Sir Charles Baskerville, the hereditary title, incidentally, seems to be his, not his family's. Neither Hugo Baskerville nor Roger Baskerville are titled, and so may well be the product of his vast fortune rather than his lineage. Anyway, Sir Charles has an unspecified claim on the Baskerville estate and dies childless. Sir Henry is his nephew. Dartmoor's very wildness and weirdness, rare moths and orchids, Costa Ricans, and earthly creatures, aligns it then with the variety of exotic or colonial landscapes which recur across Conan Doyle's fiction. But the great Grimpen Meyer also has a literary provenance well outside Conan Doyle's own writing. We've already discussed the importance of the Moonstone for Doyle's work, and part of that novel's mystery lies beneath the shivering sands, a quicksand which looks as if it had hundreds of suffocating people under it, all struggling to get to the surface and all sinking lower in the dreadful deeps Whatever goes into the shivering sand is sucked down and seen no more. What the sand gets, the sand keeps forever. Conan Doyle was also a great admirer of Robert Louis Stevenson's story, The Pavilion on the Lynx, which he considered one of the great stories of the world. Another tale of vengeance carried out in remote corners of Britain, like Clumber, it's set on the Scottish coast, like Wilkie Collins' is The Woman in White, or Conan Doyle's own story, The Red Circle. The remorseless pursuers are members of an Italian nationalist secret society. Stevenson's eponymous pavilion is built next to Graydon Flow, an infamous quicksand which would swallow a man in four minutes and a half. But the work which most directly parallels Baskerville's is a book of Dartmoor, published in 1900 by the Devon clergyman, man of letters, and Victorian all-rounder, the Reverend Sabine Baring Gould, who also wrote a study of lycanthropy, uh, the Book of Werewolves, and wrote Onward Christian Soldiers. Baring Gould was obsessed by Dartmoor, and in the words of his biographer, throughout his writing, whether on history, folklore, archaeology, or in fiction, depicts it as charged with wonder. And it's entirely possible, likely in fact, that Conan Doyle, actually, Conan Doyle actually read a book of Dartmoor while he was there with Fletcher Robinson. Certainly, the book prefigures many of Basker Baskerville's preoccupations and images, the tours, the Neolithic settlements, the prehistoric inhabitants, the orchids and rare plants, the supernatural tales and folklore, and most especially, the bogs. Bering Gould begins the book with a long and detailed chapter on the bogs of Dartmoor. This is the first thing you need to know about this remarkable place. Of the quaking bogs, he writes, that it's a difficult matter to extricate horses when they flounder in. Every plunge sends the poor beasts in deeper. And the worst of them is Fox Tormire, which once bore a very bad name 
and is composed of horrible yellow slime, and to cross it one must leap from tuft to tuft. Baring Gould himself recalls how he once sank into a Dartmoor bog over my waist and felt myself being sucked in as though an octopus had got hold of me. Dartmoor's bogs, he writes, were reputed to be populated by large, glaring-eyed monsters. In 1897, Baring Gould had written his own novel of Dartmoor, Guavas the Tinner. And the novel is set against the background of a very gothic moor, full of horror, ghost-like. Its protagonist, Aldad Guavas, keeps a wolf as a companion, a foul fiend, his hair bristling, his eyes gleaming in the firelight and glowing like carbuncles. The action comes to its dramatic conclusion in Fox Tor Mire, as the wolf attacks the villainous Dickon Roll, who sinks to his death. Out of the mire emerged a hand clutching wildly in the air and then sinking below the surface. To draw to a conclusion, when he first hears of the legend of the Hound of the Baskervilles, Holmes dismisses it as only of interest to a collector of fairy tales. But, as Doyle knew, even if Holmes didn't, the collecting of fairy tales and the study of folklore more generally was a business which the Victorians took very seriously. The Folklore Society, formed in 1878, codified a renewed interest in folklore studies, often with a distinctly nationalist or regionalist approach, from scholars, poets, and anthologists such as Andrew Lang, Fiona MacLeod, Sir William and Lady Wilde, Joseph Jacobs, or W.B. Yeats. For the Victorians, there was nothing particularly unusual or outré about being a collector of fairy tales. And in fact, Conan Doyle's own father, Charles Altamont Doyle, was a commercial artist who specialized in pictures of fairies. Uh, that's one of Conan Doyle's father's most famous paintings, in fact, of fairies. British folklore is rich in legends of black dogs and phantom hounds. In folklore and legend, dogs are often understood as liminal beings, mediators between two worlds. They mediate between the animal world and the human world, as exemplified by the folk legend that after the creation, a gulf opened up between Adam and the beasts, and the dog leapt over the gulf to join Adam. Dogs have their feet in both worlds. They, off, they also mediate between the worlds of the living and the dead, which is why they're often associated with boundaries. The dog Cerberus guards the entrance to the underworld. Dogs are believed to howl at the deaths of their owners, because unlike us, they can actually see the angel of death and more generally can see the spirit world. Thus, the appearance of a ghost dog could only be interpreted as an omen of death. Hell has its own hounds, of course, and black dogs are often, often thought to be the devil in canine form. Phantom hounds are often described as flaming or having fiery eyes, eyes that shine, burning red. As the folklorist Theo Brown notes, black dogs are sometimes chthonic, coming out of, living in, or associated with the ground. And they have a particular affiliation with pits or holes and occasionally with mines. Sometimes they're seen sinking into the ground. They're significantly associated with prehistoric ruins, with cromlechs and standing stones. And Devon and Dartmoor, in particular, is home to several legends of black dogs and other phantom hounds. The folklorist Catherine Briggs recounts a Dartmoor black dog story with affiliations to some aspects of Baskervilles. A 
traveller sets out across the moor from the Royal Duchy Hotel in Princetown and encounters an enormous dog, neither mastiff nor bloodhound, but what seemed to him to be a Newfoundland of immense size, which pursues him across the moor until he gets to a crossroads. Tradition says that a foul murder was many years ago committed at this spot, and the victim's dog is doomed to traverse this road and kill every man he encounters until the perpetrator of the deed has perished by his instrumentality. In 1638, a black dog appeared from the sky with lightning at Widdicombe on the moor. Later versions of the tale have the hound accompanied by the devil on horseback. In their account of the folklore of Devon, Jennifer Westwood and Jacqueline Simpson list a number of phantom hound tales. At the church of Buckfastley, on the eastern fringes of the moor, not far from Fletcher Robinson's home in Ipplepen, lies the tomb of Richard Cable, the wicked squire who reputedly hunted maidens for sport and was doomed to be pursued through the afterlife by a pack of spectral hounds. I've visited Cable's tomb and it definitely looks as though it was built to keep things in. <laughs> there are numerous other black dog stories in local folklore from Devon and Dartmoor in particular. And there were also Baskervilles in Devon, including Harry Baskerville, the Robinson family coachman who drove Conan Doyle around on his 1901 visit and who understandably was to make much of his surname in future years. And it is a resonant surname and one on which he understandably dined out for the rest of his life. Although Conan Doyle had come up with the novel's title before he met Harry Baskerville. But the main branch of the Baskervilles are from the Welsh border around Herefordshire and have as their family crest a wolf's head erased or pierced through the mouth in bend sinister, point upwards. The crest is attached to an old family legend, according to which one of the ancestral Baskervilles in a drunken state ran his faithful wolfhound through with his sword when the dog started barking to warn him of the approach of an enemy. Henceforth, Theo Brown was told, the death of the head of the family was announced by the baying of a hound. Conan Doyle unquestionably had a lot of material on which he could draw when he came to write The Hound of the Baskervilles. In conclusion, a whole interrelated complex symbols, themes, and patterns recurs throughout Arthur Conan Doyle's fiction. Colonial retribution, unstable landscapes, priceless jewels, fantastic beasts. Especially, it seems, the beasts. Conan Doyle's England is a recognizably modern place, a place you can navigate by means of ordnance survey maps and Bradshaw's railway guides. But it is also a land of jaguars, leopards, baboons, swamp adders, cave bears, pterodactyls, <laughs> lions, mongooses, and demon hounds. Any reader who believes that the mystery of the novel is solved with the discovery of the tin of phosphorescent paint, the proof that there is no demonic hound, has missed the point of the Hound of the Baskervilles. The known and the unknown, the material and the spirit worlds, the natural and the supernatural, positivistic certainty and superstitious doubt are all layered into the same 
landscape into which you, the reader, are liable to sink and get lost. This is England. But England is not the place you thought it was. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daryl, for a fascinating talk. Although I think my main take home was that Arthur Conan Doyle was a bit of a cad, the co-author from hell. We've all had one. If you haven't, you possibly are one. However, I'm sure many of you have rather more profound insights, so Daryl has kindly agreed to take some questions from the audience. So who'd like to kick off? Thank you, Eve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eve. <laughs> no, absolutely. Uh, of course, of course you're right. Uh, you know, I mean, first of all, like a lot of, and this is a version I was trying to suggest, of, um, of, of a domestic version of imperial adventure fiction. And like a lot of, like all imperial adventure fiction, um, uh, it, it, it's, 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 a, it's a novel that's largely played out by a cast, a, a, an all-male cast. There are some women in the novel, uh, um, but, 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 but largely uh, um, uh, all-male. And so, also like, um, like King Solomon's Mines, for example, um, yeah, it is precisely um, in the landscape, in the idea of, well, first of all, of the, um, of the desire to, uh, to, to sort of control and assert ownership over um, uh, uh, the, the, the land, um, uh, that, that there is a kind of gendered relationship going on there. I think you're absolutely right uh, uh, to, 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 to suggest that, 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 that um, you know, that there, there is in some way something kind of, kind of feminine and, yeah, if you like, absorbing about, uh, uh, about the... I mean, I wouldn't be so ungallant as to liken women to bogs. <laughs> that doesn't seem right under the circumstances. Um, so, uh, but, 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 but point taken, um, uh, uh, I, I think. Um, uh, and absolutely, and, and so, you know, th there, there is in the same way that, you know, th 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 there's a desire to uh, uh, um, uh, of kind of control ownership and domination of the land, uh, the possession of vast fortunes uh, that, that, that somehow come out of the land, come out of the bog. You know, the bog is full of gold, full of jewels, full of these. So uh, absolutely, I, th I think that, 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 that there is a gendered reading uh, possible. It's thwarted um, in, um, in Baskervilles very interestingly um, because Beryl Garcia, the woman whom Sir Henry Baskerville believes to be Stapleton's sister, uh, and so is, is kind of um, courting, um, and, you know, with a view, I suppose, to uh, marrying and continuing the, this, 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 this broken, interrupted, unproductive Baskerville line, because the wretched bloody dog keeps, um, uh, um, you know, uh, interrupting them. Uh, uh, just as they're about to, you know, procreate, and um, uh, uh, but, but um, you know, Beryl turns out not to be Stapleton's sister, but to be his wife, and so there, 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 there is this kind of—it's a simultaneously kind of quasi-incestuous, but a strangely sexually perverse relationship that's going on um, uh, there, 
uh, as well, but it's one that, that, that means that, you know, the continuation of, of, of a lineage and inheritance and all of that is, 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 is broken and thwarted. In some way, the hound has got something to do with that as well. I'm not quite sure what it is. Um, yeah. Next question. Hi, Daryl. Thanks for a great lecture. Sorry to follow on from um, Eve on bogs, because I'm sort of fascinated by bogs and detective fiction, actually, at the moment. But also the notion of bogs as a type of archive that they preserve, and the link to detection and knowledge itself. And if you'd sort of thought about that too, that they, you know, they, they're almost like a temporal archive, but at the same time, they're geological, so they're preserving something quite historical, but also what what, that when you recover something from the bog, that sense that it hasn't decomposed and linking it to the supernatural. No, that, that's exactly right. Um, uh, that the, 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 there, there, it is, it is preservative, um, uh, and, and yes, so, so um, things emerge out of bogs periodically. Things, 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 are, and, and in some ways, the hound itself, uh, you know, kind of emerges out of the bog. This, this ancestral demon. Um, um, emerges out of the bog, and, and uh, but you're absolutely right also to su suggest that, you know, that there is something to do with, with the, the, the the kind of preserving uh, 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 quality, the, 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 the kind of archival quality of of, 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 of bogs there uh, in 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 a novel that is to do um, with you know kind of family histories and family secrets and you know. Uh, the, a novel which, to, to, to return to the, 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 what I was trying to, 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 to say to Eve, you know, um, um, you know, what the Baskervilles want to do is continue the line of the Baskervilles, but they're never allowed to do so um, because, you know, there's a primal violation that takes place at the beginning when, when Sir Hugo rides down uh, um, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the maid or the young woman um, uh, and, and is... is, 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 is um, uh, um, is, is, is murdered by the hound. Um, so, in some way, the yeah, the, 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 this kind of sense of a, of a of a sort of smooth continuation or perpetuation of, of, of a line um, is, is something that's kind of thwarted by the book because it keeps it keeps throwing up, doesn't it? All, all of all of these things, um, and, and you know, <laughs> it's one of the things that the bog never really allows you to do is to die. You know? um, and Holmes himself becomes an embodiment of the of the moor. He's the man on the tour. You know? um, uh, Holmes couldn't die either. You know, he doesn't believe in vampires, but he's kind of one. Uh, you know, Condor tried to kill him umpteen or several times, and he kept rising again. He kept resurfacing again uh, out of some kind of bog. Um, so yeah. One final question, bog-related or otherwise. <laughs> Hi, Daryl. Uh, what do you make of uh, Doyle's involvement in the Cottingy Fairies uh, hoax? Because you got that fascinating. Because he had the picture there by his father. Yeah. And you have that fascinating tension between Doyle, the rational investigator, but then Doyle, who ends up endorsing um, the, the uh, I feel like my grandmother would curse me for this because she believed in fairies, but the existence of fairies, now I'm a protagonist yeah. in a horror film, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, that tension between credulity and uh, rationality, I suppose, which is sort of part of your talk as well. It's extraordinary. That, 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 that's something that, that, that I, I just really didn't have time to go into, um, uh, but I'm very glad. Um, that, that you, uh, you you raised this one, Bernice, because yeah. So so this this is Charles Altamont Doyle, um, a painter of fairies. That's what he did um, for a living. Doyle himself was from, like Sherlock Holmes, in fact, was from a family of artists. He had art in the blood. Uh, that's what Holmes has, and that's what that's what Doyle himself has um, as well. And, and so Conan Doyle's father was first of all a professional painter of fairies. And second of all, um, a, a drunk and possibly a lunatic. He, was so he certainly ended his days in a lunatic asylum. Um, and so throughout, I think Conan Doyle's like, we have the 
this extraordinary tension uh, between, you know, the man himself who was, uh, you know, a respectable public figure, an imperialist, um, uh, um, a doctor. He was, you know, not just a doctor, but a graduate of Edinburgh Medical School, Edinburgh University Medical School. School, uh, you know, the foremost, the most advanced medical school of the, of, of the 19th century. Um, uh, and so, you know, you, you have the Conan Doyle who has this kind of scientific background, and then the Conan Doyle who comes increasingly to believe in the existence of the supernatural. But you also have then the Conan Doyle who creates Sherlock Holmes, you know, the, the, the great literary rationalist, um, whom he then always spends his we're trying to kill uh, because he's a great literary rationalist and, 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 and he's moved very far away from Conan Doyle's own interests. And this all comes to a head, well it comes to a head first of all during, this, during the First World War um, uh, when, you know, with, with, with carnage all around him and with several of his own relatives in fact uh, 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 killed in or as, uh, as a consequence of the aftermath of the war, um, a revived interest in spiritualism. Conan Doyle had always been uh, 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 a spiritualist, or always been very interested in spiritualism, but he kind of comes out as a spiritualist in 1917. Um, and from there, dedicates the entire rest of his life to spiritualist matters, opens a spiritualist bookshop, spiritualist press, um, to the extraordinary sort of detriment of his own reputation. And as you say, this comes really comes to a head when, uh, uh, with, the, with the affair of the Cotton and Fairies in the 1920s, uh, when what was seen very obviously to be um, fakes, they, they were fakes, cut out of a magazine, uh, staged photographs of fairies. Conan Doyle, uh, 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 you know, went to the gallows, went to the wire, uh, insisting that these, these, were, these, these were real. Um, so I, I think that the, the contradiction On that note, um, I would like to thank you for what was a great talk. Uh, thanks to Valerie and especially Jade for making the evening go so smoothly. Thank you all for showing up, including the provost. And um, delighted that so many um, staff from the School of English showed up. It's great to see you here in force to uh, celebrate your colleague. And with that, let's go imbibe some drinks and talk fairies and bogs over in the senior common room. Thank you.